Good afternoon. Welcome to Edusat Network. Friend, today we are going to discuss new social movement. What is new social movement? Because before distinguishing between old and new social movement, we will try to know what is social movement. I will see how it has emerged in India in the context background and also we will talk about the possibility and prospect what it have for the development. And for discussion on this great topic, we have in the studio Dr. Satish Jha. He teaches political science in Delhi University and has a specialization in political theory. So I think his knowledge and experience and how he interpret using the theory of the movement will help us to understand the new social movement and will also give a new insight to understanding the movement going on. So, on behalf, I welcome Dr. Jha for a research lecture. Welcome, sir. Thank you. In fact, uh, today's uh, discussion on new social movement uh, is uh, quite uh, you know, topical mm -hmm. as well as uh, quite significant for understanding the social and political process in India. Because what we are uh, witnessing today is uh, proliferation, uh, proliferation of uh, number of uh, you know activities in society uh, which have been uh, you know called uh, movements. And they are normally, uh, you know, called social movements. I mean, social movements, uh, in the sense that you know, most of them have originated within society uh, with the obvious purpose to bring about significant, you know, changes in social, mostly social, but also the political life of the people. Now, uh, to begin with, when we talk of social movement, normally we mean by social movement those actions which are collective. At the same time, all collective actions do not qualify to be called social movements, but only those actions, collective actions, normally uh, you know, are called movement, which have certain characteristics. Characteristics like, uh, you know, they have some sort of ideological orientation in terms of what they want to attain, what they want to change, and what they want to, you know, gain through those actions. Number two, it is also believed that, that those actions have to have some organizational framework, network. Unless there is an organizational network uh, behind these collective actions, they cannot be called movement because you have all different types of collective action. For example, right is also a collective action, but we don't call a uh, right or such, you know, action, such acts. Uh, which are, of course, collective, uh, but we don't call them movement. So, some sort of organizational network apart from ideology, because organizational network and ideology provide a kind of, you know, a perspective, a kind of, uh, you know, a vision, a kind of, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, a framework through which collective actions get their meanings. So, basically, uh, in fact, all collective actions do not qualify to be called social movements. Only some of them, uh, you know, enter that uh, qualification, enter that, you know, characterization. Now, coming to the third characteristic of social movement, apart from, uh, you know, the ideology and organization, is leadership. 
Now, leadership is also very important factor. Of course, not necessarily the leadership in you know traditional sense, uh, the way we understand leadership that every movement uh, is to have a leader at its top. But some sort of uh, leadership, understanding of leadership is also important in social movement because ultimately it is through the leader that you know certain objectives are sought to be realized in an organization and ideology are to be you know networked and are to be fused together. So leadership's role is also considered to be important. But the most important factor in a social movement is or any movement for that matter is the element of objective goal unless you know these actions have goals before it what they want to do and it is here that ideology plays important role i think unless there is a goal element of you know uh, uh, you know target objective goal i think that no action whether it is collective or not can be called a movement so I think these characteristics, these elements are important for understanding any collective action which uh, is qualified or which is basically uh, you know uh, qualifies itself to be called a uh, social movement. But you know apart from these four elements there are two three important uh, things which we, sh we should remember. That you know as we have seen that all collective actions cannot be called movement, only some of them can be called you know uh, a movement. Number two that you know these collective actions normally originate in society among people with a purpose. The purposive act you know there is a purpose behind it and purpose normal, normally is change, change for you know better I mean in terms of qualitative change I mean they seek to transform they seek to change society qualitatively not only in terms of quantity but also quality and therefore this change oriented nature of such action is very important therefore sometimes these movements are you know categorized as different types of movements you know reformist movement radical movement you know a uh, status quoist movement, reactionary movement, progressive movement, you know there are various types of movement depending on the nature of change which they try to bring about within society. If it is meant to bring about you know a progressive change, a qualitative change, a change which is basically uh, you know targeted uh, towards uh, you know the structural aspect of the society, if it is a structural change then it is normally called a radical uh, movement if it is simply you know trying to change or you know trying to reform certain things then sometimes they are called reformist social movement so all these things are there when we try to discuss this issue called social movement in india social movement as a whole and also in india now this new social movement is a term uh, which becomes interesting why it is new and what is the difference between new and the old because there is nothing called old social movement but social movements and the new social movements now in india normally it is believed that uh, you know the 80s late 80s we have had the proliferation of such collective actions around number of issues which were traditionally ignored and therefore you know around these issues some actions materialized and those resulted into a new set of politics the politics which has been called as a new social movement now in fact there is also debate on this issue that uh, in periodization that when uh, should we consider uh, you know the beginning of this new social movement there is one school which believes that you know new social movement in india can be traced back to the post emergency period i mean when the emergency was lifted in india that is 77 onwards we have had number of such instances where the traditional understanding 
of uh, you know power traditional understanding of society social processes and many other things changed and you know people realize the limitation of political movements uh, centered around electoral politics and therefore i think that new alternatives were searched and out of that you know you had this whole host of new actions called new social movements but there is another you know school another opinion i mean there are a set of scholars who believe that it is not post emergency period but rather it is you know 80s particularly late 80s that we can trace the origin of new social movements in india now i am reminded of one special issue of a journal called seminar which was uh, in fact um, brought out in 89 uh, and it was devoted to this issue of new social movements and that was the time it was believed that you know issues like farmers movement women's movement green movement ecology movement and uh, you know movements around science you know issues like science and technology alternative technology and many other issues uh, were emerging which you know people uh, felt that you know this uh, traditional understanding of politics or the traditional mode of politics uh, would not be uh, enough to deal with these challenges and therefore a new generation of uh, political uh, you know activists new new genre of politics in fact emerged within civil society and that in fact uh, uh was you know a new social movement in india now this new social movement sometimes people also try to you know compare and contrast with the similar thing happening in the western world the new social movements but uh, here in fact before i uh, move further i would like to uh, point out that while making this comparison one should also remember there is a marked difference between what has happened in the west and what is happening today in india in name of new social movements in fact uh, i will come to this issue later that what are the major differences between the two you know processes or in fact the two uh, variants of this uh, politics but uh, one thing uh, normally which we uh, see that whenever this new social movement is discussed people believe that uh, in the west in the similar way a new you know mode of political action has started a new mode of politics has started and uh, that has certain characteristics and therefore uh, you know they have been called new social movements uh, because the issues which they have raised were not raised earlier either in the mainstream mainstream political movements or the social movements understood in the traditional sense and therefore they thought that you know it was the beginning of a new phase and it was called new social movement in the west but uh, you know apart from the occurrence of these movements there was also a theoretical or ideological you know churning going on within the west uh, in the name of uh, post modernism because it was believed that the you know the western society had entered a new phase of development that was a post industrial society and therefore some of the visions some of uh, the processes which characterize this modern period in the west uh, associated with this uh, phenomenon called modernity i think it was believed that they have run their course and they are now showing their limitations they are showing their problems and therefore they needed to be interrogated and the new social movements in fact emerged essentially or primarily to interrogate those processes which emerged in the west largely uh, due to you know this uh, modernist project so therefore new social movement had a theoretical ideological underpinning in the west mostly coming from uh, a new theoretical development that is uh, called post modernism both in literature in social science and in many spheres of intellectual life so what has happened that uh, you know the new social movement normally has been understood in the west through the lenses provided by this you know ideological you know, framework called postmodernism now postmodernism has number of 
you know, uh, theoretical positions on number of issues, but the most important, uh, you know, issues which it tried to problematize was the question of the relationship between a state and the civil society. And number two, the nature of politics. And therefore, this entire question of micro politics, local level politics, or the politics around the issues which pertain to local, not universal, particular, not universal. And then the entire state and the entire class, because non class characteristic of this movement. It was believed that you know this post industrial, post modern period. Uh, is characterized by a situation where the class issues are not the only issues through which operation, you know, subjugation, uh, discrimination and domination are materializing in society. Therefore, certain new categories have to be, uh, you know, invented and certain new categories have to be brought into the discussion. And therefore, the politics also has to, you know, organize itself around the new issues, which, you know, necessarily has to be the non-class issues, whether it is gender, identity, or, you know, for that matter, ecology, or the rights, not rights only in terms of, you know, economic rights, but other rights which do not have purely economic content, but are valuable for human beings. So, therefore, this non-class, non-state, or Sometimes it is put as entire state because the state is no, uh, you know, is no longer a reference point for uh, these uh, movements in these discussions. But it is believed that it is a civil society discourse because it is a largely within the purview of the societal processes that these, you know, changing dimensions of power have to be understood. And therefore, this postmodernism and a new social movement. I mean, the discussion of the two uh, have gone hand in hand in the Western uh, social science as well as in Western society. But coming back to India, we find that there is a difference because number one, the context is totally different. It is not the post-industrial or the post-modern situation which they believe, I mean, the Western social science believes that is, is characteristic of the western situation uh, is true, you know, to India. It is also not true that these social movement, new social movements which uh, have emerged in India are purely along the same line as we have seen in the west in terms of non-class, entire state and purely local or the micro focus of these activities. Because in India, the class itself is highly a complex process, class formation and you know the class politics. Because of late, now we have seen that how this class caste nexus is being understood uh, in both society, politics and the social science, that the intricate relationship, the mediations, number of mediations which basically go into uh, making the two, the caste and the class. That is there. But apart from that, there are many issues in India which have, you know, a both class as well as non-class articulation. For example, there are issues uh, which appear to be a non-class issues, but if you look deep down, you will see that, you know, there are certain class articulations. It cannot be totally insulated from its class background, class framework. Similarly, the state, you know, the state formation or the state process which we find in India in terms of its role towards social transformation is also different from the West. And therefore, when the new social movements in the West try to problematize this issue in terms of, you know, entire state uh, framework, in fact, that does not make much sense in Indian context. Because in India, what happens that, uh, you know, the state uh, itself is a major agency of social transformation. As a state itself, you know, is basically one 
agency through which the society tries to realize itself, particularly in the post-independent period, last 60 years. Of course, there are, you know, major limitations of which this process has finally met with, but we will come to it later. But the thing is that whether it is the old social movement or the new social movement, they cannot totally ignore the importance of the state and the state agencies in any viable or any, you know, any, any discourse of alternative which is sought to be built through the mechanism of politics in society. And therefore, the new social movements in India have to have a different reference point than what we have seen in context of the West. So therefore, this uh, analogy of new social movements and particularly this comparison between the West and the India has to be qualified adequately because this uh, context is totally different. Now, coming to the second uh, important aspect is that this social movement, why, we call, why do we call it social movement? And what is the difference between a social movement and political movements? Now, it is normally believed that, you know, the most important difference between the social movement and political movement is that political movements uh, seek to, you know, deal with power and power mostly which is basically available through the channel of electoral politics. Therefore, they have a kind of understanding of politics which is normally traditional, which is basically legal constitutional, which is basically you know, institutional. Whereas, the social movements, whether be it uh, old or the new, they have a different understanding of power. Sometimes, you know, uh, it, is, it may not be institutional, it may be institutional, it may not be institutional. Number two, the entire, you know, the focus is not simply in terms of capturing power, or in terms of, you know, dealing with power, but of course, power may be uh, one of its reference point, but the purpose is to, to bring about change in society, bring about transformation in society, bring about change in the life of the people, change in the processes within society. Therefore, it is always change oriented. Whereas the political movement also may try to seek change, but in fact the reference point or one can say that the mode of bringing about the change is totally different. I mean uh, the mode of uh, political movement of you know mode of bringing change for a pro political movement would always be institutional, would always be you know in a democratic politics could be electoral and uh, so on and so forth, but that may not be true with, uh, you know, the social movements. Now, normally, therefore, it is believed that social movements, most important priority is social transformation. Now, how to understand this social transformation? I mean, social transformation in terms of changing the existing uh, structures of both discrimination, subordination, exclusion and so on and so forth. So therefore, the social movements are necessarily geared towards bringing about change or social transformation and therefore, they seek to number one, interrogate the existing social order. They interrogate the existing social order. Therefore, they are not normally a status quoist, you know. They are not a status quo is because they question it. Number two, they clamor for an egalitarian social order. They simply try to bring about change which can ultimately lead to a social order which would be egalitarian, equitable, non-discriminatory. Now, then at the same time, they also try to reimagine many things. They try to reimagine self, they try to reimagine the group identity, they try to reimagine, you know, social processes in a new way. So, I think this reimagining things also 
are part of this process of social transformation which this uh, you know the social movement normally tries to do and in this case the new social movement is no ex ex exception. Then there is also a search for the new modes of political action because it is true that you know democracy operates on certain established understanding of political actions. What are the actions which can be taken recourse to in any movement? And therefore, democracy both facilitates as well as puts limitations on the range of possibilities so far as this political action is concerned. But one thing is very important to remember that what is ruled out normally in a democratic society in context of the social movement is the use of force and violence. Normally, therefore, the social movements have to you know find out new ways and new means to you know to organize collective action in a manner that it may not turn violent it may not use force and still try to deal with the power structures new challenges because always social movements have to think in terms of evolving new method of doing politics because the challenges keep changing and therefore because it you know, it, it necessarily doesn't uh, have to operate within the framework of institutional politics. Therefore, it had that autonomy to reimagine and visualize alternative modes of political process. Therefore, we have seen that number of experiments have been made of uh, doing politics around number of issues. Now, from the farmers movement to women's movement to Dalit movement, uh, you know, to, for example, anti-corruption movement is most important issue today, which is perhaps the new generation of a new social movement. I mean, we have seen that how a new methods of politics are being invented. Of course, there are some uh, methods which are already part and parcel of our, uh, you know, discourse since the time of our freedom movement. But I think that uh, with the changes in technology, with the changes in communication, with the changes understanding uh, you know new modes have also been incorporated into the entire process now therefore i mean uh, you know with this background that first of all that there is difference between social movement and political movement then there is a difference between also the social movement i mean new social movement of india and the new social movement which we normally uh, know by the same name uh, in the western context now we have to see that uh, you know this difference between the new and the old new social movements and the old social movement now what is the difference because you see in india i mean the social movement is not something so new because we have seen that from uh, you know since the time of our freedom movement we have had number of powerful currents political currents within society and uh, I mean those uh, discourses, those politics, those actions uh, try to address both issues, both questions, questions pertaining purely to political power as well as questions which pertain to social processes, social structures, structures of domination and subordination, structures of discrimination and exclusion. So the, the, therefore, it is not something new that we are only today witnessing something uh, called uh, the social movement. But one thing is important here that in India, when we were dealing with uh, you know these issues earlier before independence, uh, in fact, what happened that these movements mostly uh, pertain to the question of redistribution and question of recognition and representation. These were the two main concerns of the movements at that time. And even the political movements at that time had to grapple with these issues. For example, Indian National Congress at that time, which spearheaded the anti-colonial movement in India, also grappled with these two issues, particularly after the advent of Gandhi on the political scene. But at the same time, there are other, 
you know movements which were within the society which didn't have the macro presence like the indian national congress which didn't have that type of political vision which indian national congress had but nonetheless they grappled with these issues in a big way and therefore what happened that after the independence some of those issues with with which these social movements grappled with were incorporated within our constitutional framework as our constitutional goals or constitutional values mostly you know put under the broad rubric of liberty equality and justice now therefore what we see that after independence what social movement tried to achieve before independence now after independence the state within the overall framework of constitutional government governance try to basically push forward or take this entire project forward in terms of realization of those goals so therefore we find that you know two joint hands the social and the political uh, in terms of the integration of these values within our constitutional vision i mean indian constitutionalism one can say but interestingly what happened that uh, from 1947 we have had number of you know experiments and number of processes in name of nation building in name of democratic politics in name of you know institution building in name of you know distribution redistributional politics and so on and so forth therefore for number of years we saw that you know there was i mean there was a situation when these i mean uh, these currents which were there in the society earlier remained dormant for many years for one can say that you know for two three decades they remained totally dormant because people thought that now it is the state which is committed to bring about the changes and therefore they have to repose faith in it for accomplishing this task so every i mean every individual in indian context was looking towards the state and a state's democratic you know project a state's nation building project and so on and so forth that how it is trying to you know involve integrate everyone in this process and how you know these you know goals and these uh, you know these uh, objectives which were led down uh, you know would be achieved to the instrumentality of the state but what happened that later particularly after 60s a kind of you know a, a kind of disenchantment disillusionment how uh, one can see uh, basically you know taking root in the society particularly when they discovered i mean the people discovered that uh, you know the entire project was getting derailed therefore the instances of exclusion you know the discontentment on issue of redistribution discontentment on issue of representation or the recognition of both group identity as well as you know many other types of identities i mean when these things were noticed then suddenly we find that again there is a quest a surge for a new politics outside this mainstream political process which is normally associated with the electoral politics now what happened that uh, the issues around which this uh, alternative was sought to be created uh, alternative politics was sought to be uh, you know uh, you know searched or organized what happened that most of the mainstream political parties were already uh you know seized of these matters for example every political party had a frontal organization or a you know a wing devoted specifically to these issues women's issues farmers issue i mean for example every party if you look at indian political parties they will have one frontal organization for farmers peasants you know working class workers students women's travels you know dalits and so on and so forth 
So basically the mainstream political parties gave this impression that they are already seized of the matter and therefore there is no need the way we had earlier before independence to have a separate movement around these issues to bring you know these issues on the mainstream agenda of politics and therefore the mainstream political parties gave this impression that they were not only seized of this matter but they were in fact trying to find out suitable ways and means for redressal of the grievances and rectification of some of you know some of the injustices uh, which are basically seen in the social context and therefore all the structures of discrimination and exclusions are being addressed within the main uh, mainstream political process particularly within the framework of constitution law and the government but in spite of mainstream political parties giving this impression we find that the 60s and 70s we have had you know proliferation of activities and those activities had their high point uh, you know in the pre emergency jp movement where you had you know the merger of number of social activities and political activities and when jp jayaprakash narayan gave the call for total revolution it was basically amalgamation of the number of issues which had been generated in the society due to the discontentment and disillusionment with the mainstream political process but you know the failure of jp movement and the subsequent experiments uh, particularly which resulted uh, due to this movement that was the janta experiment as people call it or what happened that people realized that such experiments if ultimately have to be rooted through the mainstream political process or electoral process then it would ultimately lead to the same result what the just janta experiment ultimately led to therefore the post emergency period as many people particularly you know the gail ombets is one of the such scholar who advocates this line that the post emergency period we have had a new generation of politics materializing in india and therefore it is the beginning of the new social movements whereas some scholar like ramachandra guha and others would you know call 89 80s late 80s at the beginning of this period so i mentioned in the very beginning that there is a debate that in terms of periodization when to consider uh, you know which period we should consider as the period when this new social movement started in india so what happened that uh, this post emergency as uh, as as i mentioned that gail ombet is one such advocate particularly in her book reinventing uh, you know revolution uh, she takes this position and uh, other places also other papers which she has written on this issue so post emergency uh, she believes that particularly the beginning of the farmers movement in india particularly the satkari sangathan sarad joshi Uh, and others in maharashtra and you know in karnataka and different uh, parts of india now there are number of issues which are uh, normally uh, dealt with while dealing with the farmers movement i don't have the time to go into the detail it is believed that in you know, terms of trade which became unfavorable to the agricultural sector in post emergency period and therefore uh, particularly in the during the emergency and post emergency period the farmers mobilized themselves and basically uh, you know they organized as a lobby and uh, tried to seek redressal of some of their grievances though they necessarily didn't participate in the political uh, you know uh, process mainstream political process but nonetheless they acted as a important pressure group therefore this uh, you know farmers movement uh, in fact uh, for many scholars is one such indication that a new brand of politics started in india now after this uh, uh, this farmers movement there was also uh, you know a dalit movement and the women's movement because the women's movement normally people believe that uh, during emergency i mean uh, this towards equality report and then the realization about uh, the you know abysmal uh, you know you know change or one can say that the pathetic conditions 
uh, or uh, the, you know totally non improvement in terms of their social status uh, social status of women led to a new thinking new realization that how to seek change how to bring about change in their lives what are the new ways which can be thought of so women's movement dalit's movement farmers movement all these movements one by one people say that you know in post emergency period started coming to the center stage and therefore it is the beginning of the new era in terms of uh, you know this uh, political uh, in terms of this collective action called social movement then what is new about it why they have been called new social movement that is another in, in, you know important issue to uh, discuss now it is believed that the old social movements were purely you know occupied with with the issues of class and at times with caste and therefore mostly with the issues of redistribution you know poverty and other similar issues whereas this new social movements brought new perspective on number of issues on the issue of farmers they raised the entire issue that it is not only the class understood in terms of the production process i mean the the kind of kind of exploitation on the point of production which is normally normal way of looking at the class and the class discrimination and class exploitation but the farmers also farmers movement try to problematize another issue that it is not only on the point of production but also point of consumption or point of circulation through market that it is not only the land owners what say landless but it is between you know the countryside what say the cities it is between the industries what say the agriculture it is the farmers are located in the villages and the industries located in the cities so new kind of class disparity is taking place in india because of our economic development and the entire strategy of economic development therefore a new perspective on development now this new perspective on development did not simply apply to the farmers but also many other movements which subsequently materialized in india particularly on issues of science and technology alternative technology now what is basically role of technology in uh, you know creating structures of discrimination and exclusion how to think in terms of having alternative technology similarly the question of you know the dalit politics now the traditional way of understanding this caste was slightly broadened within this new framework of the, you know this dalit discourse so was the case with the women's i mean traditional understanding of women's empowerment also underwent changes so what is normally believed that these new modes of understanding social and political process was totally different from the old understanding which characterized similar things in the past but they were you know social movements mostly geared towards the traditional uh, brand of politics so therefore it is believed that the new social movements brought new understanding to our political and social process now what happened that again it is to be remembered that when they problematized this issue of class as we have seen in the case of the farmers movement they you know tried to define class in a new context in the context of india's developmental strategy that how farmers as a class is not part of that structure which is basically associated with exploitation and domination but it is associated with a structure which is itself discriminated due to the terms of trade unfavor unfavorable terms of trade so this class was basically uh reconceptualized and here many people feel that this reconceptualization uh basically was done with the help of new theoretical uh, you know ideas 
which came not only from Marx, but also from Max Weber, the sociologist for whom this market and you know this circulation, circulationist logic is very important for understanding class formation in society. So, therefore, this farmer movement did it. Now, similarly, the question of identity, what this women's movement and the Dalit movement try to problematize. Now, identity in terms of you know difference or identity in terms of sameness, because the earlier as I mentioned that you know the earlier movements uh, when in colonial period took place around the same issues. I mean, the, the focus of these movements was in terms of basically, uh, you know, seeking or achieving a social order in which there will be sameness, I mean, the citizenship rights, the difference, you know, uh, refining difference or, you know, emphasizing difference was not, not the main issue. What was basically important at that time was that erasing this difference, so that a more, you know, homogeneous social uh, situation or social order can be created. But here, instead of focusing on the erasure or uh, you know erasing this difference, what was basically uh, emphasized that it is not simply erasing difference, but it is also important how to recognize this difference. Because unless you recognize the difference, I think there are certain things which are associated with that identity will not be properly appreciated. And therefore, the entire question of identity was reconceptualized, both within the women's movement as well as the Dalit movement. So, this new social movement tried to bring these issues to the center stage of political attention. Now, similarly, as I mentioned, this ecology, the science and technology, the students, you know, the green movements, and so many other movements which we have seen over the years emerging in India have tried to reconceptualize many issues of discrimination, many issues of oppression and many issues of exclusion in the same way. And therefore, they have not simply interrogated the state and its policies, but have also tried to you know interrogate some of the social processes which are responsible for these things. Therefore, what I mentioned in the very beginning that when we compare these new social movements with the new, you know, with, with the western counterpart with the same name new social movement, we have to be a little bit careful. Because as we have seen in the case of west, number one they are normally non-class in the entire state. In Indian context we have seen that all these movements which are normally called new social movements, the class issues as well as you know the state policies are central feature of these movements. They cannot simply ignore the state power and because you know whether it is a farmers movement or the Dalit movement or the women's movement or the science and technology movement, one can see that a state is the important reference point. For that matter even today when you know in last few months or a year we can, one can see another variant of this politics which has you know uh, surfaced here in name of anti-corruption movement. Now, anti-corruption movement one can also call as part of this larger discourse of the new social movement, because this anti-corruption movement also seeks to bring number of issues, uh, you know, to the political, uh, you know, uh, center stage and at the same time also seeks to transform, not only simply is, you know, targeting uh, the institutional change, but tries to, you know, bring about a larger issues within broad uh, rubric of this discourse called anti-corruption movement in society. Now, here also the state is an important reference point. Therefore, in Indian context, the new social movements have to have a, you know, an important element of a statist ideology. I mean, th th whether you, you know, try to seek change within the, with, with, within the ambit of a state or you simply try to bring about changes within society, but nonetheless one has to refer to the state policies that cannot be ignored as we have seen in the case of the West. Similarly, the class dimension, because every issue has a, a, you know, a class underpinning and therefore the class uh, dimension can also not be ignored in the Indian context. Now, coming to 
But then you know next issue after this understanding this difference between the new and the old that why this these movements have been called new. One thing is important that is what is this ideological uh, you know underpinning of this movement because there is no single meta narrative of these movements around which the entire process can be understood. For example, many of these movements are Gandhian in their orientation. They broadly swear by the name of Gandhian ideology. There are movements which are, you know, in terms of their leaning as a radical and left, mostly drawing on the ideas of Marx. Some of these movements are basically relying on the theor theoretical and ideological resources of Ambedkar. Some of these movements are hybrid in nature, not necessarily relying on one, but trying to bring ideas from two, three different ideological streams and then try to create their own utopia. I mean, the kind of imaginary or, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the, the way they are imagining the future society and politics, they are basically drawing on the resources from different traditions. So, therefore, it is very difficult to basically uh, put them or any one of them within one ideological framework because there are number of ideas coming from different sources which are becoming valuable for their political action. Now, before I touch this issue of this ideological uh, uh, you know issues pertaining to these movements, we should also remember that these movements in India, the new social movements, to some extent one can say uh, is not totally new, though we call them new because you know we have to differentiate them from the old, but they are not totally new because you know they in one sense one can say is a continuation of the larger historical process which started more than 100 or 150 years ago in India. And those processes, when they were incorporated within, uh, you know, the democratic politics spearheaded by the state, when they fail to deliver, then I think that again these movements have resurfaced. Therefore, one can see them as a continuation of an emancipatory discourse, which started in India much before independence that 1947. And that emancipatory discourse now basically coming to their own in terms of having their separate identity, I mean these movements having separate identity and not being part of the larger uh, you know, process which at one point of time was sought to be done through constitution, through law and through uh, you know, the state machinery. So therefore, this is a continuation of that emancipatory discourse and therefore, what we find today that this emancipatory discourse in India. Uh, is basically relying on the three important traditions which have dealt with this emancipation. And those three traditions as I mentioned the Gandhian, you know, Marxian and the Ambedkarite. Now, the question is that how to have a, you know, a text of emancipation for this new social movement, where every new, every movement needs a text, ideological text through which you know utopia can be realized or utopia can be regenerated recreated and therefore what kind of text you know they can work with and it is here that it is significant that these movements are now trying to have a dialogue you know with all these traditions now this dialogue with these traditions uh, sometimes is also looked at as a difficult task because some of these traditions are believed to be antagonistic to each other and therefore it is believed that for these new social movements even the even if they try to reconcile the irreconcilable i think it will be not feasible in politics to basically translate those visions those goals which these three ideological you know streams uh, try to achieve to different mode of politics. But at the same time, one should also, uh, you know, uh, remember 
that this establishing a dialogue is always part of the political process because politics and the dialogue are two variables through which you know democracy survives and therefore within a democratic context i think these new social movements are perhaps best suited to establish this new tradition of dialogue within these three traditions which we have mentioned that most of the new social movements are trying to draw the resources from whether it is the marxian the gandhian or the ambedkarite traditions whether it is the farmers movement or you know the dalit movement or women's movement or the science and technology movement or for that matter the anti corruption movement today so i think that this dialogue and creation of this text because ultimately what would be the text for indian emancipation is the moot question today and who will author this text now it is normally uh, you know when the new text of emancipation is created the text is normally created by individual but normally text originates in a context and particularly the social situation which facilitates the creation of that text so today's context one can say that at this crucial juncture when india is facing number of challenges both in politics and in society as well as in economy i think that these new social movements are best you know placed to create this new text of emancipation where not only the resources from these three you know recognizable and uh, you know visible traditions are drawn but also resources from their own experiences experiences in terms of dealing with the challenges which are coming today in india perhaps which these three uh, you know ideological traditions did not encounter 100 years ago but today i think they are part and parcel of our political and social life so therefore these new social movements when they try to create this new text of emancipation i think uh, they should also remember that it is always through the interrogation of the established tradition in politics that a new should be created so i think that this is perhaps the silver lining this is perhaps the ray of hope that these new social movements do not ultimately turn into another instance of you know a collective action which normally slips into you know uh, you know oblivion in due course of time rather they provide something tangible for both you know for both society and politics through which a future can be you know uh, chalked out so the what is the final goal of a new social movement and what is the fodder of it how can it sustain that is important in fact uh, you know the so far as the goal is concerned as we have seen the goal is basically social transformation now social transformation when we uh, say then social transformation itself is a highly loaded term the social transformation of what because when we talk of social that includes economic cultural political and number of issues but one thing which we should remember that these social movements that way are highly you know micro issues movement okay. i mean one one issue one theme you know movement one can say that because they are organized you know around one issues and therefore ultimately it is in terms of the networking of these movements because when they talk of social transformation social transformation has to have a holistic you know perspective but that is true but given the history of social movement in india we find that all social movement exhausted when its goal is not a political or uh, in course of time it does not take color of politics so it gets exhausted so in this uh, perspective or in this context do you see any future of the social movement in india is a very interesting question because this is one of the dilemmas which normally people find with reference to such movements which on the one hand ignore the political mainstream political process and power and at the same time try to deal with them mm-hmm. now it is believed that in democratic politics the normal threat is of co-option and marginalization okay. that either you join them if you join them then you will be co-opted your identity as a non-political formation will be lost if you ignore it then you will be marginalized okay. some of the groups we have seen are very vibrant groups but ignore the mainstream political process for long and ultimately they are marginalized, marginalized. so how these social movements show their 
you know, uh, their imagination in terms of dealing with this political space so where, yeah. where they are not marginalized oh. as well as they are not co-opted. So, so that is the test. Can we conclude like this, uh, that social movement in India is in nascent stage and uh, still uh, will uh, have time to take it a concrete shape? Oh yes, definitely. And uh, it is in process of evolution, okay. a transition. But I think that uh, with the coming, you know, uh, I mean the, the growing challenges, we can see the, we can perhaps think in terms of uh, having, you know, more and more such, uh, you know, processes and such movements because the limitation of the mainstream politics okay. is coming in a big way uh, before us and therefore I think they s have started offering a new ray of hope. Okay. Right? So, so well friends, there are a lot of problems and challenges before social movement but uh, still there is a ray of hope as Dr. Satisha said. So we are, uh, we can understand that uh, so far the social movement has identified their uh, process or you can say what can lead from here so and where have to go so this is what we can say at this stage they have uh, at least identified and will certainly take certain shape in coming days so with this word we conclude the lecture I thank all of you for watching the lecture and on your behalf I thank Dr. Satisha for giving such an insightful lecture on new social movement thank you very much